Good morning, everyone. We are so good morning. Good morning. <laughs> we are so excited to welcome Melody Hobson to speak to us this morning. Um, we're going to begin, like always, with a brief meditation. Uh, one of our most recent graduates, Andrea Gomez, will lead us in a moment of silence. And then when she's finished, Ivan will introduce our speaker. Thank you again so much for being here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you, Andrea. Welcome to our summer speaker series, the Devon Summer Speaker Series in Spanish Harlem. Um, last week, we had somebody who moves at superhuman speeds. Uh, and this week, we have somebody who moves deeply and moves in the halls of power where her name echoes with resonance and great affection. Um, in preparation for this morning, I did a lot of research, not just on our amazing speaker, Melody Hobson, but the people around her and what they say about her. And I think the keynote is, somebody who moves with power and grace and a depth of generosity. To her immediate bona fides, she is co-CEO of Ariel Investments, which is an internationally recognized investment firm, which young people, CEO means she's the boss of bosses. She's also chairman of the board of trustees of Ariel Investment, Trusts, which if you're familiar with the Godfather movies, she's the bosses of bosses. So she is the capo di tutti capo. Um, so beyond moving at the highest levels of world finance, she's also reached down to her community in Chicago and throughout the nation, investing in fi financial literacy for children so they can shape their own financial destiny. And she is, holds a seat at corporate, corporate boardrooms across the nation. She is a vice chair of the board of Starbucks. She has been the chairman of the board of DreamWorks Animation and Estee Lauder companies. And then she's moved also, moves also, as I say, in the worlds of not-for-profits. She's chairman of After School Matters. World Business Chicago, the Museum of Narrative Art, the George Lucas Foundation. It goes on and on. She began her life working very deeply and getting expertise in the world of finance. And now she's in the worlds of education, of the arts, of literacy. Um, she has basically done it all and appropriately has been honored with a number of degrees uh, at the highest level uh, in this country. You wonder if Melody Hobson sleeps and the research says that she does not. Seems like she gets up at four o'clock in the morning and goes swimming and then from the pool hits the ground running almost literally. Um, my favorite article on, on Melody Hobson, I love the title, says, why does the world love Melody Hobson. Her life trajectory is absolutely spectacular, and she'll tell us about that in, in, a, in a moment or two. But the world does love Melody Hobson. Part of it is her steely resolve matched with this balance of deep humanity and concern for others. Um, if we do our job, dear audience, we will find out why the world loves Melody Hobson. <laughs> Um, I will turn it over, uh, turn the cameras over to Melody, and I will um, ask her some questions. Let me, let me start, actually. I'm going to stay on camera for a moment, and then it'll, it'll pivot to 
to Melanie Hobson. Will you tell us your amazing life story and where you grew up, how you grew up, and what were you like when you were like our audience, about 12 years old? What was the world like for you? Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I love speaking to 12 year olds and in many ways I am still 12 in my heart. So um, I hopefully you'll see that I'm a kindred spirit. I grew up in Chicago and I'm the youngest of six kids and in my family, I'm really young. So when I was born, I had siblings that were in their twenties. And as they all told me when I was born, uh, I was not expected. And so they used to tease me and tell me that I was left on the doorstep. <laughs> really their sister. Um, when you are so young, when you have siblings that are in their 20s when you're born, I'll tell you all the things you never get to do. Like you never get to sit in the front seat of the car. Um, I thought chicken was only chicken wings. I'd never had any other piece of chicken. Um, because they got the better pieces whenever we went out to dinner or had chicken. Um, and they basically, I had all these parents because I didn't have siblings in a traditional way because I was so, I was a little kid. Um, I also, interestingly, two of my sisters had children when they were very young. So two of my nieces, um, one of my nieces was older than me um, by two years. And then I had one niece that was younger than me. So in many ways, I had all of these older siblings. There, in my family, there are five girls and one boy. And then I had these nieces that were basically my age that, that were like my siblings. My mom was a really great mom. She was very different than me, super quiet and shy, um, and, uh, but really, really wise. And, um, she just really worked so, so hard for us, but often couldn't make ends meet. And so as a result of that, we ended up having just all sorts of unfortunate circumstances. They won't be sound foreign to you. I used to get evicted all the time. We used to get our car repossessed and we used to, uh, at the store, my mom's bounce check would be on the wall of the store where she'd write a check that she knows she didn't have the money, knew she didn't have the money for, but we would need food. And um, it was really hard. And sometimes we lived in, my mom was in the real estate business and she would convert these old buildings into apartments. And sometimes when we didn't have anywhere to live, we lived in buildings. And um, it was rough. I mean, we were like, you know, we would boil water to take a bath and we'd have a hot plate and we'd heat the room with the, the oven. Um, all of these things come back to me and they're very, very deeply etched in my heart and mind. My husband always tells me it's because when you're a child, whatever happens to you really sticks with you. I know you're, you're all maybe in some of that period where some of these things that happen to you really stick with you. They stick with me in a way that motivated me and made me want to have a better life. And so I decided when I was really, really little, I mean like five years old, that I was going to have a better life, literally. And I used to tell my mom, when I'm big, things are going to be different. And I actually made that happen. And the one other thing I'll say about my mom, she was, um, she did her best. And sometimes I think it's really important for us to understand that our parents make mistakes. My mom would do things like buy um, Easter dresses instead of paying our light bills. So our lights would be turned off, but we'd be in new Easter dresses at school. I mean, at church, and that would really bug me. And I remember at one point, my husband saying to me, you know, by all accounts, you turned out okay. Your mom did the best that she could, and you should always remember that. And so in hindsight, as I think through all of those struggles, I know she loved me and she tried really hard. And even when she made decisions that I didn't think were great decisions, I know she was trying to do her very, very best for me, given the, the, um, the, the tools that she had. And so I tried to just leverage all of that that I learned from her um, and, and channel that into really, really, really working hard at school. Because I figured the only thing that could create a better life for me was to learn as much as I could. I knew I had a good brain. And I to use the brain 
to the best of my ability um, for others and for myself. Ivan, you're muted. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, what a beautiful story. And, and it really is the American story. And it's the Horatio Alger story, but it's real. And it's a woman. And it's a woman of color. It, it, you really are somebody um, it, at my advanced age that I can look at a, a younger person and deeply admire the story and hold it up for, for everybody I meet going forward. Um, can you talk about some of those transitions on a more granular level, level for our students? About, you know, what was it like um, coming from a, a household that was going through such struggle and going to high school? What was it like going to Princeton? The, the Princeton story is kind of crazy. You were recruited to go to Princeton but by one of my childhood heroes, Bill Bradley and I uh, just, um, but it, it's an amazing story how people were drawn to you. But to, can you tell us what it was like going off to high school and then um, later off to, to one of the top institutions on the planet and turning down Harvard? Yes. <laughs> so um, these are crazy stories. Okay, so I'm in eighth grade and I need to go to high school, right? And so what I do is on my own, I was the weirdest kid you ever met. I'm like a little kooky. I found my own orthodontist. I used to have fangs on my teeth that were on both sides. And it was like so awful looking. And I decided I have to get braces. I have to get braces. So I asked all of my friends who had braces where they got them. I made an appointment at the orthodontist by myself. I in the middle of the day at school and got an excused absence from school. And then I negotiated with the orthodontist a payment plan of $25 a month, which was a lot for us, so that I could get braces. That is a true story. So then when it was time for high school, I researched all the high schools in the area. The public high school was not a school that I wanted to attend. And so I researched all the high schools and I basically went to my mother and I said, this is the high school where I'm going. And it was called St. Ignatius College Prep. And it was a private school. And I found out what they, they, the test was. I got myself there to take the test. And then um, I filled out all the paperwork literally by myself and then applied for financial aid. This is, I was in eighth grade. And we got financial aid. And I'll tell you a story about that that was really a bit dramatic. And I got into this really great high school, one of the best in Chicago. So my family had to pay $750 a year. And the tuition was around $3,000 altogether. And they gave me the difference in scholarship. But my mom couldn't pay the $750. I had an A plus average at school. That is 4.33 out of a scale of four. I told you I was really, really dedicated. And one day I'm sitting in my classroom and someone from the principal's office comes in and says, um, says uh, the, you need, you're needed in the principal's office. And so I say, I get up to go to, go to the to principal's office and they said, bring your stuff with you. And so I'm like, okay, so my heart starts racing. I'm like, what's wrong? Something's wrong. Why do they have me bringing my stuff? So I go down to the principal's office. I have my backpack, all my books, everything. And they, the principal brings me into their office and they said, your mom didn't pay your tuition. You can't come back to school until she does. And I'm devastated. I mean, like a, in a way that you can't possibly imagine. So they, to make me wait in the office in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, and they send me home. And I cannot go back to school until my mother comes up with the $750, which may as well be a million because we did not have the money. And so I had to stay home for days. And I am literally a basket case. You can't, I mean, just crying, upset, worried that I'm going to fall behind, that it's going to affect my grades. And miraculously, true story, my mother pawned something so that I could go back to school which can you imagine turning away from a, a child who's getting great grades, et cetera, from school for $750? That story will come back in a minute. So I go back to school. I'm more committed than ever. Like this is not going to keep happening to me. 
I dig in, I work really, really hard, and I apply to the best colleges in the United States. I apply to Yale, I apply to Harvard, I apply to Princeton. I, my safety school was Boston University. I also applied to Georgetown. And I get into every school. And now I'm really not sure about what school to attend. And my mother is convinced I have to go to Harvard because she said, if I go anywhere in the world and I say I went to Harvard, people will know that what I'm talking about. She's like, you could be in an African village and say Harvard and they know what you mean. And I decide to go to Princeton. And she's like, what are you thinking? She says, Harvard's like Coca-Cola and Princeton's like Sprite. No one in the rest of the world knows Sprite and everyone in the world knows Coca-Cola. Why wouldn't you go to the school that's Coca-Cola? Well, I ended up going to Princeton. I had an unbelievably great experience. I went on campus and I have to say, because my high school was so challenging, I was ready for Princeton. But I will tell you, I got a D minus on my first test. And our grades were shown, are listed by, um, and posted for everyone to see. So you say, how did I get a D minus? I sit down to my first test and I don't understand the question. And at Princeton, there's an honor code, which means that the, the, the professor leaves the room when you take the test. But I didn't know they were sitting outside of the room and I could have the question clarified. So it's a three hour test with four questions total. And I panic in advanced biology, panic, sweating for three hours. I am beside myself and I can't figure out this question, which is about um, the squirrels mating and being crossed in terms of breed. So I panic, 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 I get a D minus. And I think I'm not cut out for this. I call my mom, I said, they were all smarter than me, I'm going to fail. And she's like, pick yourself up and do better. So I go to see the teacher and I say, what can you give me for extra credit so I can fix this grade? And they're like, you're gonna come to the lab basically every minute that you have and put in extra time to get your grade up. So even that, I ended up, ended up with a great grade at the end of the class, but there were setbacks along the way as I was finding my way in these new environments. Just amazing stories. I hadn't heard some of these. Um, you know, one of the keynotes, I think, in terms of your, your character and quality, and, and you speak with such aphoristic wisdom of somebody who's like uh, much older, um, where did you, but bravery is one of the keynotes that, that if somebody, I, I, if I had to describe you, where did, you said you were a strange little kid, where did you get this bravery to do the orthodontia, to face the advanced biology, do, do you know if, where it comes from? I mean, it's obviously some of it's from your mother's, you know, just tough, stolid, forward thinking approach, even though, you know, it was, it, there were some failures. Where, where did you get this will? So part of it was my mother made me independent. She worked all the time. So anything that I wanted to do, I had to figure out for myself. If I wanted to go to a birthday party, my mother would say to me, how are you getting there? How are you getting home? Where are you getting money for a gift? Nothing was left to her. It was all left to me. I told this story once that when I was a little kid, I went to a friend's house and her mother made grilled tree sandwiches for us. And she was standing making grilled cheeses on the stove. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm making a grilled cheese sandwich. And I said, grilled cheeses are made in an oven. She said, no, they're made on the stove. So I went home and I said, mom, Mrs. Smith makes grilled cheeses on the, uh, on the stove. And my mom said, grilled cheeses are made on the stove. I said, but we make them in the oven. She said, we make everything in the oven. And she said, the reason that I did that from TV dinners to grilled cheeses is because you had to cook for yourself starting when you were a little child. And I didn't want you to take pots and pans off the stove with the possibility of it falling on you. And so I wanted you to reach into an oven where I thought it was safer for you to take food out by yourself. This is the kind of thinking that ultimately raised me because I was spending time with my nieces alone. And so ultimately I ended up being so independent in my thinking. And I think that gave me a lot of courage to figure things out. There were no cell phones. There was no one to call. You had to figure it out yourself. And I, I at the time maybe didn't love that, but now I cherish that that happened to me because it made me so independent. And I'm sure there are a ton of you that are watching me that know exactly what I'm talking about, where you have to fend for yourself. And it may seem like just ugh, the worst, but it does create, again, more strength for later in life. And now I appreciate it. And I'm glad because I 
just can't figure anything out by themselves. And the one thing I'll tell about being bravery is I'm convinced so many people don't accomplish what they should accomplish in their night lives because of fear. And I always ask myself, what is the worst thing that could happen to me? And so many people sit it out or don't speak in meetings and don't do things because they're afraid. And bravery is not the absence of fear, it's overcoming it. Courage is overcoming fear. Not everyone feels fear, but what do you do when that fear is there? Do you stare it in the eye and stare it down? Or do you allow it to defeat you? And I have to tell you one people, person who's taught me a lot of bravery, Lewis Hamilton brought his steering wheel, I heard. <laughs> and Lewis is one of, he's like my little brother. I introduced Devin to Lewis. So I've decided to bring my own um, show and tell today. So you know that I'm married to this guy that I call Yudad, who made Star Wars. Well, I asked him if he would come and visit then and say hello. Do you guys recognize hello. him? Heroic. What, what an epic, epic couple. I you know, behind every every great woman is a great man. What what, what an honor! Um, uh, you you resonate from from my childhood years. You know, I was I was looking at at your wife's amazing amazing life trajectory, and it's like only somebody like George Lucas, some mythical man, deserves to be a life partner to some amazing woman like this. What this is crazy. I was telling the kids, you know. <laughs> I, I say, you know, Melanie You can ask Hobson. him anything you want. Ask him oh. anything you want. One, one of the secrets of life. All right, well, let me- Marry let me, somebody <laughs> smarter than you. The kids are 12 years old. Okay. That are on this, they're well, it's life. for the boys. All right, so, so, so may, we'll, we'll open this up Marry to- Marry somebody to, smarter than you. Um, I, I just want to say before we open this up, I mean, this, this is Did the I most- Did I beat powerful. Lewis? Come on, I gotta beat Lewis. I, 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 I have to go back to him and said, I did better than you, Lewis. No, uh, you, you did uh, even without George I Lucas. Am. You did, did beat, Lewis goes fast, you go deep. <laughs> he, uh, yeah, but he brought a, a uh, steering wheel from a Formula One car. I can't compare to that. <laughs> yeah, no, believe me, you beat that in, in, in millions and millions of people's eyes. Both of you, what, what a beautiful and amazing couple you are. Um, I, I just want to say before we open it up to questions to you amazing people, you know, the, with the Black Lives Movement, and then you may get some questions with that, Melody, that I, I want to say that you were six, at least six years ahead of this, speaking really strongly about being color brave and people wanting to skew the edges of this honest discussion um, that, uh, and, and this 400-year this legacy that the country is, is facing. And, 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 and it's been so beautiful. And so, you know, you are somebody who embodies Rudyard Kipling's friends. You walk with kings and queens, but you keep the common touch. You guys are, I, I, I'm gonna cry, so we'll turn it over to the kids and get the kids. What, 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 an, what a gift that, that, uh, that you conjured for us this morning. So, uh, well, Ms. Duncan. Let's ask George one question. George, you made Star Wars for 11 year olds. They're 12. No, I made it for 12 year olds. Oh, 12 year olds, sorry, 12 year olds. They're 12. They're 12. So if you had any advice for them, 12 year olds, from your perspective of Star Wars, what would you tell them? 12 year old kids, well, black and Hispanic. There's a lot in there, you know, uh, lots of lessons to be learned because they're, it's based on ideas that have been a long time for 12 year olds who are making that transition from being a child to being an adult. And 12 years old is when it happens. So you're gonna get a few rough years here while you make that transition. Uh, and uh, then hopefully you'll go off into the world with a better attitude about what you're supposed to be doing. So. Heroic and epic moment, both of you. All right, uh, Ms. Duncan, let, let's turn it over to our team. This is, I'm not easily impressed. Devin is killing me. I'm gonna have a heart attack every week. But no, Lewis goes fast this way. You go, you guys go high and low. I mean, George, I mean, George Luke taps into Taoism, Buddhism, just great ancient, ancient wisdom. He did it on a big screen. It's still a reference point to so many people 
uh, you know, up and down the age spectrum. So, uh, Ms. Duncan, let's let's put this beautiful power couple uh, open for an interrogation from 12-year-olds. Absolutely. Our first question comes from Yuritsi, who is a seventh grader. Go ahead, Yuritsi. Hi, my name is Yuritsi. I'm in seventh grade, and your TED Talk, Colorblind or Color Brave, was really inspiring. You talked about how many people of color are seen in big companies. You also talked about how women are treated in some of our country's top workplaces. My question for you is, what are some challenges you face, you have faced being a woman of color during your time as CEO of Aerial Investments? Well, I face challenges every single day. They never end, I will tell you that. I tell people every single day, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, what I do. It does not get easier. The workload doesn't get easier. The, the uh, moments of truth that I have with people who are uncomfortable with my position, they don't change. I, I come home and I talk to George about them all the time and I say, guess what happened to me today? Or look at what, how this person is treating me. But what I will tell you is, I just don't give up. We were talking about persistence yesterday with our six-year-old, that you have to be persistent. And the challenges are where, I will tell you, I sit in meetings where, um, unfortunately, there are sometimes white men who don't even make eye contact with me, even though I'm in charge, because my, my, my power or influence will be uncomfortable for them. I don't get mad, though. I try to be very, very graceful and very elegant and help them see the error of their ways as best I can, mostly by being on top of the subject that I'm supposed to be an expert in and, and, and demonstrating through my knowledge that, my, that I'm very smart, but not in a know-it-all way, but in a way that So one of the things I can tell you that can help offset some of the inevitable um, slights that we as people of color are going to have, and especially women, is to come prepared. To come prepared, know our stuff, and to be persistent. Those two things make a difference. And George talks a lot about persistence because that was a big part of him being able to get all of his Star Wars movies made. He couldn't give up on that. Thank you so much. We're gonna go Wonderful. to Zida. Zida is our next seventh grader who has a question for you. Hi, my name is Zida. I'm in the seventh grade. And recently so many people in our country have been processed protesting for racial justice. What is, and my question for you is, what is your opinion of the violence that has occurred during these protests and have you ever witnessed protests like these in your lifetime? This will be a great question for both of us because George lived during the 60s when there was a lot of protests. And this is my first version of this at this level. I've never seen anything like this in my life, especially where it's been international. What is my opinion? My opinion is, first and foremost, unequivocally, Black Lives Matter. I'll say it over and over again. I'll say it in a boardroom. I'll say it on television. I think it's a very, very important statement that we need people to understand. Secondly, I um, never, ever, ever condone violence. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in trying to make a point by hurting someone. However, and the people that I most admire and respect that have walked this planet are Jesus, Gandhi, Mandela, King. Those are the people that I look to and I say, they did something very, very special with love, not hate, with not an eye for an eye or, uh, or anything like that. So They're the ones that when I think in my mind, what should I do? I literally ask myself, what would they say? Or what would they do? But lastly, I will say, even though I don't condone the violence in any way, I understand it. 50%, 5-0, of African-American adults in this country are unemployed. And I say to my white counterparts, what would you do if your children were hungry? Try to think about that. I know what that's like. I know that my mom bounced checks for us. That's illegal, but she did it because we were hungry. And I know that if my six-year-old were hungry, I'm not sure what I would do. Hopefully I would not hurt someone, but I certainly understand the rage and the anger that exists because the economic inequality in this country is inarguable. Just like George Floyd had a knee on his neck, 
our black and brown communities have knees on our economic pros prosperity, on the necks of our prosperity. And when you get a blood to your head, you die. And so we are literally and figuratively fighting for our lives. And so that's why I understand us taking to the streets. I love the, the comment that Barack Obama, one of my heroes said, you know, when you think about protesting, sometimes young people think they protest with their phone. And he said, a hashtag is not a protest. And all of this is obviously reminiscent of the 60s. And this was a time when George was around, when King was very, very visible and John Lewis and so many other leaders trying to show America what was wrong with the inequality in our society. Maybe you have an opinion of that, George, during that period. Well, um, protests have gone on since the beginning of time. You know, these kind of uh, uh, fighting for your rights uh, was very, very big in the 20s. Uh, it was very big before that. There has been lots and lots of, of people and um, so that's the only way you can actually get uh, your voice out there to say, this is what we believe in. And of course, uh, it really has to do with when you're in a, in a, in a situation where the, the government and the people uh, don't listen, you have to stand up and, and speak your piece. The, the secret ultimately like in Star Wars is that you have to not be afraid Fear is the enemy. Fear is the dark side. If you're afraid, you're going to the dark side. The, the, the light side is compassion. As long as you love other people and treat them kindly, you won't be afraid. So the secret is to just love everybody. And I know this sounds very 60s, but that's what I grew up in. Um, but it, it, it's fear that it causes and and you have to be stop being afraid and be kind to people that is and all the people that she quoted um and the main theme of star wars is that compassion is the good side fear is the bad side so beautiful i, I want you guys to be president and vice president um, <laughs> melody you'll have to be wait, wait wait <laughs> who's president you are you are <laughs> black presidents matter um, That's right. <laughs> um, George Lucas, can you can you please talk about um, where you got this this wisdom? I mean, th about and, and your upbringing. And Melody, you, you spoke so uh, no pun intended. You speak so lyrically um, and and about your life and how it's led to to your your beautiful manifestation of who you are. George Lucas, can you share the same? I mean, it, it's so beautiful. I I didn't know that fear was the dark side, I, but it, it resonates with me in terms of my own experience. Can you talk about what, where you got your wisdom from uh, it, it going from, you know, it, where were you at the age of 12 that got you to this point where you're saying such things now? Well, it came from my experience in college and I became very, very fascinated in anthropology. And I became very interested in how societies uh, govern themselves, grow, become something. Uh, you can't really uh, have a society unless you have a common belief system. And then there are people who are very greedy or afraid. The thing about people who are greedy uh, is that they fear. Their, their whole soul is drenched in fear. And they're, first of all, they're afraid they're not going to get af afraid. They're not going to get all the things they want, power, wealth, fame, and they'll do anything to get it. Then when they get it, they're afraid they're going to lose it. So they live in fear their whole life. So remember that about people who are um, not nice. They live in fear. Fear is not a happy thing to live with. Uh, you're always afraid that somebody's going to take your stuff away from you. And it's the same thing uh, with, your, uh, with your life. Uh, and it's the same thing with the people you love. You have to understand that the, the, the reality of nature and God and life is that things come and things go. They do not stay in your life. And you have to learn to accept the fact that it is a continuum. 
that you're just a part of and the things will be there and then they won't be there. So enjoy them and love them while they're there and then be happy that they've gone someplace else. But you have to decide that you can't hold on to people because the, the pain of losing somebody uh, or losing something is your pain. It's not the pain of, you know, um, that person. Uh, it's your, your pain of losing that person being with you. And you have to be able to overcome that. Otherwise, you just suffer your whole life. So you know, beautiful. At, at Ariel, I had a colleague who, who told me they were leaving, and I was so devastated. So devastated. And George looked at me and he said, well, first of all, Melody, there are over 300 million Americans. If you found her, there's another one. <laughs> Secondly, Jedi don't hold on. And he's like, and you're a Jedi master, so you don't hold on. And I just shifted. And when I sent her her note, goodbye and good luck and have a good life, my subject matter was Jedi don't hold on. I cannot hold on to you. And I learned that from George. This is something you also learn uh, with your children, because there is a point in your life where you have to let them go and be on their own. And it's a very hard thing to do. You're starting to reach that period. Uh, and it's a great consternation from your parents that you're going to be off to college. You're going to be having your own life. You're going to have your own house. And you will constantly hear, why don't you call me more? Why don't you come home for uh, this function or that function and it's you know it's a natural thing but the more you hold on the more painful it is and if you just let people go as I say if you hold on to a if you have a bird in your hand and you hold it too tight because you don't want it to go and fly eventually you'll crush it so the important part is to let it go and fly off and be on its own it'll come back and uh, the love will be even stronger. Amazing, amazing. We're gonna go to- Let, let me ask you both this. I mean, I'm sorry to cut in, but um, does, a, does a particular world faith connect to your understandings of things? And a Melody, you mentioned Jesus, and then both of you were talking about this notion of, of non-attachment and and, and things passing, and that resonates with Buddhism. Do, 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 do you follow a particular faith, or did you come on these understandings uh, independently? It, 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 it's, it's wonderfully update and lyrical, and, and also deep and, and feels ancient. Well, you gotta remember, I'm from California. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> the Zen Buddhism capital of the United okay. States. But at the same time, uh, in my study of anthropology, and my, which is basically the study of different religions and different um, uh, ways of thinking of things, um, you know, my kids asked me, what are we? What, what am I? I said, well, we're Methodist Buddhists. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, and you discover in anthropology that, you know, um, there's, well, I, one way which I said, which is when I was about, I don't know, seven years old, the age of my daughter, uh, I asked my mother, what, if there's so many different religions, why is there only one God? And she couldn't answer that. But if there's only one God, you realize that the religions are a manifestation of man or woman, but it's man but the God is still there. It's just we don't know what it is or what it looks like or what it is. But the one thing it has constantly done, and in all religions, is God is love. Beautiful. For me, um, I grew up, my mother was um, Pentecostal. And so I used to go to, I was one of those kids who had church all day on Sunday. I mean, like we had lunch and dinner at church. And until I was about 12 years old actually. And when I was 12 years old, I went to my mother and I said, I have so much homework. I cannot do this. I have to stay home. So my family would go to church on Sundays and I would stay home and do my homework. 
Then I went to a Catholic school. And I went to a Catholic school where I was taught by Jesuits. And Jesuits are really famous. They're the order of priests, an order of priests. They're really famous for questioning everything. And so I was taught in Catholic school to question everything. I was also taught in my Catholic school to study all religions. And the first thing that they did was they told me when I started school, they said, you are a Judeo-Christian. That was a new term for me. That well, Christianity, you know, was born in Judaism. And so first thing we did was study Judaism in a very significant way, which is obviously first Old Testament, New Testament. So long story short, without getting too philosophical, that became my foundation. Then I studied all other religions in high school, Buddhism, Jainism. I mean, I could just go on and on with all the religions that we studied because their point of view was you need to know everything in order to decide what you believe as opposed to forcing us to believe something. And ultimately that worldview really shaped me. And I didn't choose one. I chose all the pieces of different ones that really spoke to me. And that's really the way I go through life. I have the memories of my mother and the Pentecostal church with the feigning and the passing out and the speaking in tongues. And then I also have the Catholic uh, mass with all of its order in Latin and then understanding all of the religions. George and I went to see the Dalai Lama once um, because I really, really wanted to meet him. George had already met him, but I really wanted to meet him. So we went to see him and it was deeply, I walked into the room with him and I just started crying. I couldn't well, stop. I well, couldn't stop. The only time that ever happened to me before is when I met Nelson Mandela. I was overwhelmed by his presence and I felt God. And he's not a God, he says he's not, but there's something in him that is so um, weighty uh, and you feel so much humanity in him that I was really overwhelmed and George was there and saw the whole thing. So I'm very much a believer in the spiritual, but I, we, maybe I've done it a la carte. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it resonates with me because I'm a son of a preacher, man, a Methodist preacher, but I got a meditation practice. And, uh, um, but both of you, I, I just, you both spark of the divine. It's like, it's like this is why everyone loves Melody Hobson and, and, uh, and uh, one of my heroes has chosen well by getting you to go uh, be, his, be his partner. I've got, I've got you guys, are, I, it's just amazing. Um, but I got Jeremiah Camacho, one of our, our eighth graders who has a question about Star Wars. So we'll go from the sublime to the sublime. <laughs> cool background, Jeremiah. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremiah. I'm in the seventh grade and I really like Star Wars. So my question for you is, uh, sorry. The world has changed so much since the first Star Wars movie. How do you think the changes in the fights for racial justice will impact the Star Wars universe going forward? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've kind of lost control of Star Wars, so it's going off in a different path than what I intended. But the first six are very much mine and my philosophy. And I think that philosophy uh, sort of goes beyond um, any particular time because it's based on history, it's based on philosophy, it's based, it's based on a lot of things. And, uh, you know, the, the, the first three basically tell you how a, a democracy turns into a dictatorship and you end up with a tyrant, the emperor. Uh, it's a very important now uh, where we are now in our political history. Um, the other part was that in there, it's like, um, I purposely, the, all of the various colors and shapes of the aliens and everything that live in that world. Um, it's a normal situation. There's no real discrimination. The only discrimination is against robots. And we haven't really uh, reached that period yet. And uh, I'm sure the robots will be able to overcome it uh, because they don't have the same feelings. Uh, so, um, but it really shows you in terms of the way the politics are and the way things are, uh, you know, how to fight those ideas, and a lot of it really has to do with um, with uh, overcoming fear. You know, the thing that brought that, and also the the movies 
you know, the, the uh, thing with Anakin is that he, he um, started out a great kid. He was very compassionate. Uh, and um, so the issue was, is how did he turn bad? How did he go to the dark side? And he went to the dark side by, uh, the, the Jedis are not supposed to have attachments. They can, they can love people, they can do it, but they can't attach. That's the problem when you get in the, uh, in the world of fear. Once you're attached to something, then you become afraid of losing it. And when you became afraid of losing it, then you turn to the dark side and you want to hold on to it. And that's what uh, Anakin's issue was ultimately, is he wanted to hold on to his wife, who he knew he had a premonition that she was going to die. He didn't know how to stop it. So he went to the dark side to find, in, in mythology and everything, they go to Hades and you talk to the devil and the devil says, this is what you do. And basically you sell your soul to the devil. And when you do that, then you're afraid and you're on the dark side and you fall off the, the, the golden path of compassion because you are greedy. You want to hold on to something that you love and he didn't do it. And as a result, he turned bad. So the thing about that is, George, you're saying with the, the movies, there's the time. It's not of a time, but yeah. the lessons are timeless, right? Yeah, they're timeless. They, they've been around for thousands of years. Uh, they're based on uh, ancient mythology. Mythology was designed, ultimately, to give a society the tools they need to be a society, which means they have to have a common belief system. They have to believe in the same gods. They have to believe who their leaders are. They have to believe uh, what their history is. They have to believe who their heroes are. Those are the things that combine to make a society. If you don't have those things, then you don't have a society. The interesting thing that we're going through now is the United States was a conglomerate of a lot of different ideas and things. And it was the first beginning of globalization where we began to respect other people look differently, who think differently, who have different gods. But at the end, you have to have that cohesion. And we were beginning to get it for the whole world. We now split apart, but I think we'll get there someday. But that is the most important thing, is that you respect other people, you respect what they're doing, and you realize that we're part of a symbiotic relationship, meaning that we all help each other. It's, that's the ecology of what we're in. If you take some of the gears out of the watch, it won't work anymore. And taking some of the gears out of the world means it won't work anymore. We know that from, from uh, you know, extinction of animals, we know it from uh, you know, global warming. We know that we have to all be one in order to go forward. A lot of people don't like that idea. They hate it and they're fighting against it, but we have to do that in order to survive in this, on this planet. And there's only two, two ways to survive in the world. One is to adapt, which is to, if you're a fish, you grow legs and you get on land or you migrate. And migrating for us, I mean, adapting is, you know, we've got a lot of adapting to do, but we are trying to do it. But the other one is to migrate. And if you're living in a pond and the pond is drying up and you're going to uh, die with it, you have to learn to migrate to another pond. What we're trying to do now is to migrate to another planet. And you say, well, What's that going to do? Because the sun's going to go away pretty soon, well, a couple million years. And now we only have a couple million years to figure out how to get from our planets, which we will soon be on Mars and some of the other planets, to another galaxy. I mean, not another galaxy, I'm sorry, to another solar system. One that's not dying. And that's a hard thing to do. Right now, it's completely impossible because you have to go faster than the speed of light. But unless we figure out how to do that, we're not going to survive because eventually this sun is going to go out, our planet's going to die, and everything with it. So you have to think long term. So it's like far, far away in a galaxy, in a galaxy far, far away, a long, long time ago. This is the long, long time ago. And we have to go and catch up so that we can serve, so the humans, especially, can uh, uh, survive 
uh, the planet will survive. I mean, eventually it'll blow up and there's just a bunch of rocks, but at the same time, it will not um, survive. And you have to understand that. And that's part of letting go. But at the same time, we don't have to, you know, people say, well, let's talk about it. Uh, that's millions of years away. It's like the grasshopper and the ant, where the grasshopper is collecting, I mean, the ants are collecting food for the winter and the grasshopper doesn't do it. And therefore, when the snow comes, the grasshopper has to come and ask for help because he was making fun of them. But it's that you have to prepare for the future. And that's basically what humankind can do, as opposed to a lot of other uh, life forms. The only lot of the life forms that can go through, um, you know, can fly through space and survive on all kinds of strange worlds are microorganisms. They're everywhere. And there are trillions of them. They outnumber uh, humans. And even in, you, in your body, there's more microorganisms than there are human cells. So you got to say, and that's where the idea of the secret, that's where the idea of the wills come from. The wills are microorganism. And they help create the energy, which is what uh, mitochondria do, which are in your cells. That's the energy that makes your cells divide which makes life and they feed on life. That's what the force is, the force is life. So it's an interesting point because it does go back to when you say the current uh, riots and, and some of the protests that we've had in this country, you weave that all back together and it goes back to this point of the need to get along and getting along becomes very, very important. So people are fighting for rights that will make them equal which is exactly the right thing to do. We've had many moments in world history where this has occurred. Unfortunately, we keep reliving the same stories over and over again, new complexions, different people. Um, even if you look at America, the waves of injustice that occurred by ethnicity. And, um, and we just have to keep pushing forward. And this power is not relinquished uh, easily. Well, I'd like to also say to Jeremiah that I have three sisters and they used to call me Jeremiah. That was, <laughs> that was their nickname for me. Why? I, never I have that. no idea where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> That's new information for me. <laughs> so All I'm right. We're going to, you, you guys are so agile. So we're going to, we're going to do another pivot. Uh, Melody Hobson, you're, you're the first capitalist I have heard talk about so beautifully um, affirming uh, the capitalist system because you, you talk about your work um, and, and uh, you quoted another another uh, renowned uh, financial thinker in, in terms of saying that we, we have to look at as, as if this is curing cancer. But you talk about your work, um, which is about numbers and it's about a bottom line and it's about metrics. But at the same time, you talk about things that might seem a little more ethereal, um, uh, like compassion and um, an ability to, to cast yourself into the future um, and, and in terms of philanthropy. Can you talk, we've got, we've got somebody on, uh, Corey, who's in the eighth grade, who wants to know about aerial investments and how that fits in with some of the things that George has been talking about. And also, and he, and this is a brilliant question too, he wants to know, uh, a typical day in the life of, of both of you. So I'm going to put Corey, we're going to, Catherine's going to get Corey on this. Hi, Corey. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Corey. I'm in the seventh grade. And my question for you, my first question for you, Ms. Hobson, is can you tell us how an investment firm works? And what, for a question for both of you is, what does an average day in each of your lives look like? Okay, so I'll start. So um, what does an investment firm do? I can make this super simple. So, and also why it's important. So I'm a very strong believer that finances affect our lives in every way. And if you're worried about money, it leads to a whole host of problems, including uh, mental, physical, uh, it's just not good for your health. So I want everyone to be financially secure. And I especially want 
set of black and brown people because we don't learn about investing usually in school in America. And that's a travesty. So we don't know what the stock market is, what's the difference between stocks and bonds, why is it important to save and invest, all of these things, because no one ever taught us. And if you don't grow up in a home where, with it, where these issues are discussed, you're really behind the eight ball. And yet at the end of the day, it can be life-saving. So I'm a big believer in capitalism and the capitalist system. And I think that system is the best system in the world. There's no other one that has been better. However, it needs to work for everyone and currently it doesn't. And one way to make it work for everyone is to make sure we're all financially literate. What I do at an investment firm is we manage stock portfolios for individuals, anyone, anyone who can give us $50 a month someone's kids' college saving money or their retirement money. And then we manage stock portfolios for big institutions, pension funds. It could be for the state of New York, which is one of our clients, or a company like Pepsi, which is one of our clients, or an endowment and foundation like a university or a school. And our job is to grow their money so they have the opportunity to pay pensioners, people who are retired, or to give more scholarships away at a school, or to just have more money for a family to be able to pass on money to their heirs. So that is what I do every day. And so I usually have CNBC on my screen and our team invests by looking at stocks that are trading all over the world, not just in America. And we try to buy really great businesses when they're out of favor, when no one wants them, for whatever reason, they're misunderstood, ignored, underfollowed. So what might we do in the middle of the recent stock market crash that we had in March because of the pandemic? One of the areas that just got totally trashed was anything related to, believe it or not, this sounds so perfunctory, you couldn't go to a dentist. But a company that makes all the dental equipment that dentists use. So you'd say, well, why'd you buy that company? Because we said eventually people will go back to the dentist. And right now they may not have any customers and their stock may have gotten slammed, but over the long term, they'll go back to a dentist. Or we bought a hotel company because no one was in hotels, but we say, if they can survive this, they'll ultimately be fine because one day this will be over and people will return to doing that. So we're trying to find these great businesses when no one wants to own them and our, our goal is to hold on to them for the long term. And it's tons of companies you know. We've owned companies like, right now we own um, Smucker. Smucker has Jif and, and Jif peanut butter and Smucker's jelly. You know that company. They're based in Orville, Ohio. Their street is Strawberry Lane. We just sold Tiffany's, the retailer, because they buy another company in France. And you know them, they have that blue color and they're on Fifth Avenue in New York. You may have seen them there, or you may have seen um, stories about Tiffany's as a jeweler. They've never had a sale in the history of the company. And when they get a jewelry design wrong, they just melt it down and start over. Maybe you've gotten a, you've seen people with those Kif Tiffany keychains or lockets that have a little, uh, I know young women love them, that have little hearts on them with your initials carved into them or something like that. A lot of people get those for graduation presents. So that's what we do. We look around the world for things to buy and we put them in our portfolio, lots of different companies, and we own them for a long time. Another company that we own that you would know, Madison Square Garden Enterprises. They own Madison Square Garden and they own Radio City Music Hall and they own a number of other important venues around the country as an example. And you didn't probably didn't know that you could buy that as a stock and own a piece of it. Can you and get rid of Jim Dolan? The debate this. <laughs> Listen, I'm he's sorry. been good for us. He's, he's done well for us. I know their team has not been doing so well, but uh, that's a different part of the business. That's Madison Square Garden Sports because they broke it up into two different companies. So one is the venue and one is the, the teams. And then there's one that is all the media. So that's my day is talking to our clients, people that we invest for. I spend a lot of time writing 
I'm on the phone a lot. When it's not a pandemic, I travel all the time. I go and see our customers because we could have a, an account that's $200 million or $300 million. And they want me to come and tell them what's going on with their money. And so I sit with them and I talk about how we're performing, when we're doing well, when we're not doing well, what stocks are helping us and what stocks are hurting us. George is very different now because he doesn't make movies on a day-to-day -day basis anymore like he used to. And I did get to see a glimpse of him when he was making movies um, in terms of what that day is like, which is pretty grueling. But now he's building a museum, so he'll tell you about that. Yeah, I'm sort of just uh, being a hobby archi archi uh, architect, building buildings, and at the same time uh, working on a museum, which is a museum of narrative art, which is a uh, saying that ultimately art in the beginning and still uh, is tells a narrative of society. That's how people come together and have a common belief system because in the beginning and even a lot of places now, people don't know how to read or write. And so you can give speeches, but it doesn't resonate that much. But in, especially in the, in, um, in uh, ancient times, if you go into a city, they had statues of their heroes, they have mosaics of their religion. They had, um, you know, statues of the, the leader who's ever running the country. Those are all things that um, uh, told people in a very emotional way. It's done emotionally, not intellectually, that this is who we are. And um, it's kind of a controversial idea, but I got it through anthropology and I believe in it. And so I'm building a museum that really uh, is based on the aspirations of a society. And everybody says, well, you know, you got comics in there, comic art. I said, that's what people believe in in the United States. And, and uh, uh, illustration, Norman Rockwell, um, Frida Kahlo, these are things that people believe in, uh, that that's what they, that, that's what their aspirations are. And uh, so it sort of tells you a lot about a society. And so the museum I'm building is sort of a, a, a way of connecting with what the society believes in. It's especially, I think, uh, relevant today when we're breaking, we're fracturing all that up. You know, in the end, it's, you know, I believe it's all got to come together and be homogenized um, because we're the human race. We're not a bunch of separate races. We're one race. And the sooner we understand that and begin to accept the the sort of eccentric eccentricity okay. eccentricities eccentricity of other um, races and other societies the more we'll grow and become smarter people but also the, the conflict that we have will go away i know we're losing we're coming up on our time so we want to be cognizant of that for you um yeah, uh, uh, out of respect to, to both of you, I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant uh, to finish, but, but we'll do that. Um, as, as I started out, you know, I am so grateful to Devin and on a more um, kind of banal, well, not a banal level, but um, more visceral level, um, you crushed Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> um, not just be, can no, just, I'm saying. Can we no, get that? Like, I, 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 I'm gonna have to send that to him. No, the, the dude he was. I mean, he, so you he was he was you amazing, Melody. He really was. But yeah. he's a babe in arms, uh, you know. Compared, I mean, no, you really. I mean, your story is spectacular, but you also have a way to distill it through uh, an amazing. Uh, narrative ability. I, I think it's wonderful that George Lucas is putting together this museum on, on narrative. You, you spin a beautiful tale. So um, that's another reason why, why people love Melody Hobson. Um, and Can I even tell if you, you one thing cheated, before we go? I'm going to ask um, someone's holding the camera. I want them to at, look at a picture. Can you move your camera to look at this picture right here? I just want to show you all something. This picture is from Gordon Lewis. I mean, Gordon Park. So I don't know if you all can see 
well, a little bit more. Um, it's a shore in the south and a separate water fountain. And you see where it's white only and the little kids are drinking from colored only. You don't, you can't see it very easily. They don't have any paper. That's beautiful. We're still dealing with that same legacy. And the reason that I have that, it's right across my desk looking at it to remind me where I come from, who I am, and what I have to still do. I can't hear you, Melody. I don't know if you're speaking right now. Hold on one second. One Did, we, we missed it. Were you saying something when you showed us that, that beautiful but uh, tough picture? Yeah. That's the picture Melody looks at every day. I think they're having some audio problems, okay, but it just reminds her of where she came from and the work we have to do. And she has several of- Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Okay, I was just saying, it just reminds me of who I am, uh, where I come from, and what work I still have to do. We're just, uh, and so I'm just telling you as 12 year olds, you know, the struggle that we're seeing it right now you're a part of it but more importantly you're a part of the solution we're not at the effect of the world remember what george says we all have the life that we want and you're going to be able to define what kind of life you have so don't forget that and let's remember you know the constraints that they had on them even though today feels bad it's not as bad as it was and every generation can make it better Just beautiful. Well, um, I, I am I'm stunned and, and eternally grateful. Um, I, I like to end these. We've only had two of them, but I, you know, our mission here at the school, uh, one of the key phrases is to adapt to change and to create and share lives of deep meaning, dynamic virtue, and transcendent joy. And both of you have done that through the course of your lifetimes and you've certainly uh, done it now. I mean, you really shared uh, your dynamic lives and given uh, us new energy and optimism and a clarity of, of a path. And um, we will be talking about you uh, for a very, very long, long time. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, from uh, the challenges of, of growing up in, in you know, Chicago to uh, dealing with Black Lives issues, going to ancient mythology and being able to project those narratives into a modern time frame. You guys are just a spectacular, spectacular power couple. And what a gift it's been to, to my old heart and to the young hearts of our school here. Um, in our rectangles in, in Spanish Harlem. Um, I want to give, I, I think I saw Everest for a second, shout out to Everest. Um, <laughs> she is blessed amongst young women for having such, such wonderful, admirable, powerful, good, good people who have both the yin and the yang. Um, thank you, Devin. Um, what's just spectacular. I, I had the highest of expectations uh, for you, Melody Hobson, and you crushed them. And again, you crushed uh, Lewis Hamilton um, like you were, he was a, a small common dog under the wheel of a Formula One car. I don't know. Sorry, it was <laughs> gruesome. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I went to the dark I, side I, on that, but, but uh, uh, I, I, yeah, it just an amazing day for all of us. Um, so like Catherine, uh, uh, you, you bring it back to Melody. She can say a few more words and, and we'll, we'll, we'll fade out to silence. Okay. Uh, I'd like to just say one thing that um, is important for 12 year olds, which was uh, things um, that I was taught. My me I had a mentor who was a, a, uh, a very wise man. And he said, go through life and follow your bliss, which means follow what you enjoy. And that's what I did. My father wanted me to go work in a store that he owned uh, and become a merchant. I did not want to do that. And it was a big deal between us when I said, I'm going to go do something else. And um, I found by exploring through college and other things, 
what I love to do, which is to, uh, ultimately I wanted to be an illustrator, then I wanted to be an anthropologist, and then I went to film school on accident and basically found my bliss. I found the thing that I loved more than anything. It's much more important than going out and trying to get a job and make, we're the opposite. She, li she likes to make money. That's her bliss. That's what I like to make things and movies and, and things like that. When I started, nobody who was trying to go, who was in film school, would get into the film business. It just was impossible. It was closed out to everybody. And fortunately, uh, I came in in the 60s when the people who started the studios were all 80, 90 years old and they were selling the studios. So I got a break, but I was doing what I loved and my friends who are also of that period were also doing what they love, which is to make, make movies. None of us expected to make any money at it. We were lucky if we could get, even get a job. And we, were, we became very successful because we loved what we do. We loved it and it makes life so much easier. And no matter what it is, if you're like to do pottery or like to to uh, write things or you like to do whatever you want to do, if you enjoy it, you're, you're halfway home. You, don't have, you will make money because you enjoy it. And that means you're good at it. And that means you'll make money. Yeah, you might not live in a giant place. Look, I've got a house, it's a giant house. It's too big. I never <laughs> wanted a big giant house, but I got one now because I, got the, I can afford it. But it's no different than a regular house. So, if you do what you love, you will be able to make a living, you'll be able to eat, you'll be able to have a car, and you'll be able to live nicely, and you'll be happy. Thank you so much for having us. Good luck, and um, have a good life. There's a lot yeah. ahead of you. Be persistent. Don't let anybody put you down. Lots of love.